the next hot top hot topic is whether uh, children who have a strep throat infection actually are at risk for developing either tics or obsessive compulsive disorder after that strep throat infection. This is a real hot topic because if this is true, because strep throat is so common in kids, many, many kids may be at risk for the development of TS and OCD. So today, one of our medical advisory board um, members, Dr. Tanya Murphy, is an active researcher in this area and is gonna lead off the discussion by telling us a little bit about what this syndrome is, what it's called, kind of where it came from, and then um, talk about the controversies. All right. Uh, PANDAS, uh, it stands for um, Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcus. And it's thought to be, uh, be a subtype of um, OCD and tics that follow a strep infection. And some of the characteristics of the children when they develop this are they have a sudden onset of symptoms of particularly uh, OCD is the one that I see the most of, but also tics. And they can have other symptoms like uh, emotional lability. They can have ADHD symptoms, separation anxiety disorder, new onset enuresis, uh, frequent urination where they have to urinate uh, every few minutes um, is often seen. Uh, this phenomenon started when um, NIH and some others were researching Sinehams chorea, which is a neurological variant of rheumatic fever and found that a lot of these children were presenting with OCD that was like regular classic OCD, and then started looking for children um, that presented uh, without the chorea, and, and indeed found some, that uh, their symptoms correlated with the onset of a strep throat. And the controversies are, well, strep is very common in children, um, maybe this is just a coincidence. Um, children with OCD and tics tend to have a waxing and waning course, so who knows if you're just, you know, kind of seeing the natural course. Uh, those, so those are the main controversies, um, is that it's just kind of a chance association. Okay, let's start with the mechanism. Um, the uh, most common uh, mechanism is thought to be uh, uh, one by molecular mimicry, where the um, body forms antibodies to strep that cross-react with um, proteins on the basal ganglia. And those studies, uh, there's been a lot of studies, a lot of debate going on on what's called anti-basal ganglia antibodies, uh, where they're finding negative results and some people are finding very positive results. And it could be differences in the patient selection, it could be differences in the laboratory technique. So those, that area is really unclear. So I think we're probably 10 years or so away from sorting this out. I mean, I think if you think about other autoimmune neurological disorders, they've been studying it for years and haven't figured it all out. So so that would be what I would say on the mechanism. Does that kind of cover it so, for everybody? So one of the issues with for me with the mechanism has always been this idea that sometimes you, you look at the symptom change and you look at antibody titers or r recent history of a strep throat and you get those to line up but there's isn't there supposed to be a kind of a phase delay between a strep throat and you actually developing the system these symptoms if antibodies are involved because there's some kind of delay in this whole process help, yeah, help us yeah. understand well that. the adaptive immune system usually takes a few weeks to kind of fully maximize uh, typically about six to eight weeks um, I think um, from my experience I would agree that when I see the strep still in the child's throat, it's usually OCD that presents. Uh, the tics and some of the other symptoms are a little bit more delayed. Um, then that, that's what actually brings up the issue about the innate immune system. And that's the immune system that knows that a pathogen has landed on your body. And there may be some sort of you know, central mechanism that's getting triggered to, to let the brain know that this has happened. So just to be mildly provocative, since we don't really know the mechanism, and we don't know if there's tissue damage that's caused that right. causes for a chronic condition. What about the use of prophylactic antibiotics? Does it make sense? Should people do it? Is it a bad thing to do? I don't think we should do it without studying it first uh, in, a, in a research population. And the, and the reason is, you know, I have seen children that I think do quite a bit better after going on antibiotics. Of course, we don't have the, you know, necessarily the placebo-controlled studies out there like we really would like to, and all the ones that we've had have been very small, and some of the designs have not been good. Um, 
But I've also seen in some children when they, especially the tick disorder children, when they're prescribed antibiotics, that their ticks actually get worse. And so I think, you know, until we sort out who is, you know, most likely to respond, you know, you know, is there any evidence of efficacy, then, you know, I think we should hold it off for uh, research protocols. So you So tempting. Yeah. So you'd agree that if somebody has an active strep infection, it, it should, should be, be treated. treated. Even if they're not clinically showing pharyngitis. And and then once they use, go through their usual course of antibiotic, it should be taken away as per usual practice. I would I would advocate, and this is where I differ a little bit. I would advocate for actually a little bit longer trial, because what happens with strep is that it does a little bit of what's called pinging. It's like somebody will get it from their buddy or whatever. They get treated. Somebody else has gotten it. They get it back from that person, and they kind of exchange it back and forth. And each time they get it, you know, say the second or third time, they don't show as many clinical symptoms of the pharyngitis, and so it gets missed. And so I would actually say that if they have active strep, I would advocate that you get an extension of a traditional antibiotic trial just to make sure that you're not getting the secondary infections from, you know, whoever the, the source of it, uh, illness was from the in the first so place. double 20 days or? If I've seen 20, uh, 21, 28 occasionally. But beyond that, I think you're starting to talk about prophylaxis. You just want to get them past, you know, whatever the infectious source is around them. Because we've had cases referred into us where they were placed on an antibiotic with a strep infection and a perceived exacerbation and then left on it for years. And the parents are reluctant to take the kid off. Yes, I see those all the time as well. Yeah. I don't and think we have evidence for doing that. Yeah. And it's, it's probably evidence to suggest that that's not a good idea because of antibiotic resistance or... I mean, there's not any real resistance with penicillin. Um, there is a thing called penicillin tolerance, but, you know, but certainly with the uh, macrolides, um, um, there is resistance issues. Th that's for strep. For strep. Yeah. It, it doesn't develop tolerance, but other bugs might. Other bugs might, right. Exactly. And, and, I think, and that's one of my theories as to why they get the flare-ups of uh, ticks after they've been on a long-term course of antibiotics is that they've killed off the natural flora, and then you get overgrowth of maybe non-group A streps and some other things that may, may continuously have them in an immune-activated state. So um, I think there's, um, there's good evidence not to do the long-term until we know better. So, Tanya, from a practical standpoint, would you urge clinicians to monitor antistreptococcal titers on all children with ticks mm -hmm. and OCD symptoms presenting with no. that? With, I mean, what population would you urge? I'm not sure yet that we've shown that the streptococcal titers really give us a lot of help in how to deal with these children clinically. Um, what I actually do recommend is what I call surveillance. You know, if there's strep running through the school, if somebody in the family has strep, to increase the frequency of culture, even if the child has a mild sore throat or doesn't have a lot of you know, physical symptoms to increase that frequency. And certainly if they have a sudden change in their behavior, um, then I would you know, recommend a, a throat culture. I think it's you know, cheap, it's benign enough, and if you have a positive throat culture, whether or not you're in the carrier state or you know, active infection, I would still treat it. And and can I ask you too, uh, certainly group A strep is appealing because of uh, rheumatic fever. What about um, other pathogens? Well, there's a lot of uh, case reports, not any large amounts of uh, reports, but there's a lot of case reports suggesting things like uh, mycoplasma. Um, I've seen certainly influenza worsen ticks in children. Um, I think there's been a few others. Um, I think maybe non-group A strep might, but that hasn't been shown. But I think there are other, you know, other potential triggers out there for sure. Um, when a, in my clinical experience, when I've seen a pathogen trigger OCD, it's typically strep. When I see a pathogen, when I consider a pathogen trigger ticks, it can be a whole variety of things, um, including viruses. Um, so I don't think ticks are as specific uh, for strep as OCD is. Huh. Um, so you're pretty much sold that this is a deal. I think in some kids, yes. I think they're, you know, when you have a child that comes in, been doing fine, maybe a mildly anxious child, but nothing that's uh, pathologic, uh, and then really within a couple days' time develop 
incapacitating symptoms and have strep in their throat. I mean, it's pretty convincing when you see that. Now, it, you know, it could be a chance association, and I, I think we still need to sort that out. Um, and I think if you look at children, like if you want, you know, a lot of people ask, what's the prevalence of pandas? And it's like, you know, we have no clue. But, you know, when I've looked at children, you know, from, say, four years old on up to 16 years old, the ones that have the most um, criteria for pandas are typically the young ones with a new onset. <clears throat> When you look at the ones that are older, either they've lost the, you know, the association or it's not as clear, um, their symptoms have become more chronic and doesn't seem to be necessarily triggered only by strep. So I think it's a more early, early onset kind of phenomenon. Um, there was a nice case control study uh, done in Seattle um, where they looked at um, a group of children with OCD and tics versus a group of children with uh, no OCD and tics and looked at their rates of strep prior to the onset of their OCD and tics and found that uh, strep increased the risk of uh, tics by at least twice that. If they had repeated strep, their, the odds ratio went up to 13. And um, so the repeated strep seems to be even a much more of a risk factor than maybe just a one-time strep. Have investigators who have been looking at the potential use of uh, IVIG or plasma exchange for the treatment of the acute phase of this illness, have they simply just moved away from that or, or is that still being investigated? As far as I know, I am not aware of any studies right now of that going on. Um, and there's a lot of risk associated with that and, um, and I would only see ever doing that if there was a truly incapacitated, very, very, very ill child um, because most of the children, even though they come to me in a very sick state, most of them are in you know much approved state before like a year later so what do we need to study what, what's the research agenda i think we need to get all sorts of researchers on board <laughs> i think we need immunologists microbiologists uh, neuropathologists um, neurologists uh, psychiatrists pediatricians i think we need them all on board um, Looking at you know mechanisms of treatment, uh, pathophysiology, course, um, you know what happens after these children have developed this you know strep-looking onset? Do they look like a regular OCD or tics you know type child down the road? Um, and maybe looking later on at various specific immune treatments if if we find evidence to support that. So. How loud is the other side? Because this all seems reasonable. It might be treat strep throat, be vigilant and cautious. But, you know, I know families that, that have come to me as once they bought the idea of pandas, they're done. I mean, they, you can't talk them out of it. They don't think about their kid in any other way. Well, well, Alternative one thing, treatments yeah. are not, they're not interested in them. They're about immunology, antibiotics. And, you know, you talk to them about conventional treatments, and they, they almost say, you know, that's a cover-up. You're not, you're not doing real treatment because you're not attacking the right. real disease. And right. so for some of these kids, I don't think they get good care sometimes because people have wandered down this immunology, bacteria thing. And, and we're being asked to put younger siblings on antibiotics. And so, so once, once people get this idea, yes. sometimes it... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I see those same kind of patients, and um, and one thing that I've tried to advocate for is standard therapy first, and because you know, um, one thing we don't know about our standard therapies is maybe they do something for the immune system. You know, I, I actually have some support that they do, um, and so it may be that it's you know approaching their pathology from a couple of different angles, and that's not such a bad way to go. The other thing so, that we, so like like SSRIs for OCD may have some immunologic effects. Mm -hmm. And the uh, atypicals as well. Um, the, um, the other thing that we've been uh, doing more of at, at UF is we're doing uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for these uh, PANDAS kids with the idea that if you can treat, uh, teach them skills early in their illness, then they might be more resistant to developing full-blown chronic disorder later on. And so we advocate for CBT as well. Um, so we do not do this wait and see or let's put them on antibiotic kind of, we pull out everything that we think works. And, and I, I strongly advocate for that and always have written for that. So, so let me see if I can summarize the to-do part. 
So if a kid comes in with a very acute exacerbation of tics or OCD, one of the parts that ought to be part of the workup is the throat culture. If it's, and, if it's new. I mean, if you get somebody that's six months ago, then it's probably not worth it. But right, if it's the last but, couple but of weeks. new and yeah. hot. Yes. Right. Um, that throat culture should be part of that. And if it's positive, think about treating it. If it's a kid who's had this waxing and waning sawtooth kind of course we've talked about, they have an abrupt exacerbation, pull another throat culture. And if they're positive, treat it. Antibody, antibody titers is which, what most of the folks are doing in our community. I don't think they prove anything. So antibody titers would not be something that you'd recommend people do. I think it gives you some evidence that the child has had strep, but so many children have strep. Uh, and, but it doesn't pinpoint the time very well. I mean, if you have a new onset and you want to see if it's a pandas, then get one at baseline and then six weeks later. But other than that, I don't think it's uh, very useful. If they're high, it doesn't mean much. If they're low, it doesn't mean much. Okay, that's helpful. That If we can just get people to stop drawing antibody titers, that, that will save the healthcare system a lot of money. <laughs> and then uh, prophylactic antibiotics, not yet. Not yet. And IVIG, plasmapheresis. Not standard of care. If you have a very, very disabled child that maybe it's something else and not just standard OCD or tics, yeah, I would consider it, but only in an extremely rare case. And, and what kind of center should do that? I would say a tertiary care center. Okay. Someplace that's been doing it or doing part of research. Right. You know, it's a, this is a hot topic, a great topic. I think we've, we've done a nice job with it here today. Essentially, it sounds like... Um, Please use stimulants for ADHD and kids with tick disorders, um, but Judicious. be careful. Please use antidepressants for ADHD or for anxiety disorders, uh, depression. Be careful and thoughtful. Um, make sure your diagnosis is right. So let's take a break, and uh, we'll come back and, and talk some more about the real complexities and issues in treatment of uh, kids and adults with Tourette's syndrome. Thank you all very much.